Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the University of Tasmania's Island of Ideas online public lecture series and the 2020 Japananka Errol West Memorial Lecture, uh, which is held each year during NAIDOC week and um, this year a little later in the year than, than usual. Uh, so thank you all very much uh, for joining us and uh, a particular welcome to Associate Professor Sana Nakata, who's going to be uh, presenting the lecture for us this evening. But firstly, uh, to deliver uh, the welcome to country, I'd like to introduce um, someone that um, many of you will already know, uh, but those of you uh, who don't, um, Diane Summers is a highly respected elder uh, and somebody who has been one of our most important community-based leaders in Aboriginal education for, don't want to give age away too much, but probably 30 years or more. Um, and uh, she joins us from Flinders Island uh, this evening. Thank you, Greg. Yapulina, hello, and welcome to everybody here this evening. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge my elders, past, present and emerging. I feel extremely emotional and very honoured to be presenting the welcome today as Japananka Errol West was my immediate family. He was my mother's brother, my mother's brother Uncle George West's son. Errol was born Errol George West on the 20th of June 1947. He left this life to begin his journey with his ancestors in April, on April the 11th, 2001, a very young man, just 54 years old. Errol was bestowed the highest honour with the title of Jap Japananga for his work that he did as an educator. He was known as the education warrior to many communities throughout Australia. He would always use lowercase in his name, Errol, so it always started with a lowercase e, as Japananka to him was something that was very high status and it was bestowed on him by Uncle Rex Granite, a Walpuri man. Errol had seven children, six girls and one boy. He had ten grandchildren with two more on the way and he has two great-grandsons that have only recently been born. Errol's children have passed on a message to, to me just to let their father know that they are proud and honoured that they were able to call him dad. They will always walk in his giant footsteps. Errol left the legacy with Aboriginal education he stated that Aboriginal education must have culture embedded and without culture it means nothing. Errol longed for many years to return to the Bass Strait Islands where he felt his spirit needed to be. So around 12 years ago, his family held a ceremony in northeastern Tasmania to set his spirit free. I wrote a song for the ceremony that my late husband Ronnie Summers sang titled Song Lines of the Moonbird to honour my cousin Errol's life as he always felt that he had missed something with his island culture living up in the, living in the city. I'm not going to keep you long tonight, so in closing, I just want to repeat the words that cousin Errol said to me and they have stayed with me for many, many, many years. Please walk softly on this land as it holds the stories of all our grandmothers. I'd like to thank Greg Lehman for asking me to do this this evening. Greg, thank you very much. Um, I was a bit blown away, actually. So, Hulika, and thank you all very much. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much, Di, and, and we really appreciate you um, being able to make this contribution. Um, it's um, 
Anyone who met Errol um, will know that he was he was a larger than life character, and you only had to meet him once or twice for for him to stay with you. Um, I met him only once or twice when I was first starting off here at the university back in the very early nineties. Um, but the wonderful thing about about having having you um, offer the welcome today, Di, is that um, you knew Errol very well, and um, and I think you bring him a little bit closer to to being present with us uh, this evening. Um, uh, my name is Greg Lehman. I'm the uh, Pro Vice Chancellor Aboriginal Leadership at the University of Tasmania and um, uh, came back to the university uh, just at the, uh, at the beginning of this year after 20 odd years away. Um, but, um, but was here at the University of Tasmania back in the early 90s and I'll, I'll touch on that in a, in, again in a minute in relation to, uh, to Errol's legacy. Um, Island of Ideas is a program that's designed to keep the ideas flowing during this period, this COVID period, when we're unable to host live public events. Uh, each year, the university presents hundreds of lectures, forums, seminars and workshops free of charge for our students, alumni and the wider community. Um, these are a really important part of the university's role, and it's why we're hosting forums such as this one this afternoon. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, before the forum gets underway today. Um, your microphone, camera, chat function and raised hand function have all been disabled so our speakers are not interrupted. Um, but we do encourage you to ask questions and this can be done at any time by typing them into the Q&A function that you'll see on your screens. Um, a selection of these will be answered during the Q&A. Um, we might, um, we might bundle a couple uh, of questions together if they're uh, if they're uh, talking about the same sort of issue um, but we will try and get to as many as we can uh, and we'll do that um, at the uh, towards the end of the presentation this afternoon uh, and finally this lecture is being recorded for later access um, on our YouTube and SoundCloud channels so um, if you know people who uh, wanted to be here but couldn't um, because of clashes um, please let them know um, that they can find this lecture on, on YouTube. Um, as Diane mentioned, this is an annual lecture uh, series that honors the life and work of the late Japananga Errol West. Um, not just an internationally recognized scholar, but also um, a very well regarded poet. Um, Errol was a leading Tasmanian Aboriginal academic, maybe, maybe one of our first nationally and internationally um, highly regarded scholars. And his, he was uh, respected for his scholarship in the field of Indigenous methodologies and pedagogy. So uh, it's particularly uh, appropriate uh, to have Sana Nakata uh, talking about Indigenous knowledges uh, this evening. Most importantly for us at University of Tasmania, Errol was involved in establishing Tasmania's very first Aboriginal Institute of Higher Learning. And this was called CARE, the Centre for Aboriginal Research and Education. Um, and it was to actually become uh, Riawana, the Centre for Aboriginal Education uh, in Launceston. Um, and in 1991-92, um, in uh, when um, this, the um, Tasmanian State Institute of Technology was amalgamated with the University of Tasmania, we saw Riawana uh, become a statewide operation. So. I don't know how many people realise this, but we have really got Errol to thank uh, for the work that Riawana does. So to introduce our speaker, Associate Professor Sana Nakada uh, is somebody that I had um, the great pleasure of, of um, being able to work with at the University of Melbourne when I was there last year. And it's through uh, getting to know Sana um, at Melbourne that, um, uh, that I, I had the opportunity and the idea of being able to invite her to uh, to contribute to our lecture series this afternoon. Uh, she's a co-director of the Indigenous Settler Relations Collaboration in the Faculty of Arts and also Associate Dean Indigenous for the Faculty of Arts. Trained as a lawyer and political theorist, her research is centered on developing an approach for thinking politically about childhood in ways that improve the capacity of adult decision makers to act in their interests. She has recently completed an ARC Discovery Indigenous Research Fellowship examining representations of children in Australian political controversies. 
in recent times, 2016 to 2019. And she's the author of Childhood Citizenship, Governance and Policy. And along with co-director Sarah Madison, um, edits the Springer book series, Indigenous Settler Relations in Australia and, in, and the World. So a very warm welcome uh, to Associate Professor Sana Nakada. Thank you so much for having me, um, everyone. Thank you, Annie Diane, for your warm welcome and for all the contributions you have made to Aboriginal education as well, continuing the work of your cousin. I would like to begin this late afternoon by also acknowledging that I join you today from the land of the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nations and that I am able to do so thanks to the invitation from the University of Tasmania's Pro Vice-Chancellor for Aboriginal Leadership, Professor Greg Lehman, to deliver this lecture that honours the life and work of the esteemed poet and scholar, Jafananga Errol West. I acknowledge that the University of Tasmania stands on the country of the Palawa Pakana peoples, and in particular, I wish to acknowledge the knowledge that their elders, past and present, have held and passed on across millennia. I begin with these acknowledgements, not as a courtesy that might alleviate the guilt of our institutions um, for dispossessing sovereign peoples, but rather as a way of grounding the purpose of today's talk. Past and ongoing acts of colonization have not only dispossessed indig indigenous peoples around the world of their land, but have also disrupted though clearly not eliminated, our systems of being in and our knowing of the world. Universities have played their role in this, not only through the stealing of Indigenous knowledge, as well as the bones of our ancestors, our spears, our headdresses, but also through the creation of knowledges about us that have justified and sustained our ongoing marginalisation and dispossession in the present. That the Wurundjeri peoples continue to live and live with political claim to the place that I work and live on means that my acknowledgement today is not only a mark of respect, but a thank you for the tireless labour of their elders, past and present, and of all First Nations people around the world, whose work together make it possible for me, a body marked with the colonizers' nomenclature of Torres Strait Islander, to still exist in the world as that, and also as so much more. To all First Nations people joining us today, thank you for your work. To everyone watching, thank you for being here. Today I have chosen to reflect on a quote that opens my father's book, Martin Nakata's Disciplining the Savages, Savaging the Disciplines. They are the words of former Queensland protector, John Bleakley who wrote, their condition might be called the tragedy of the inarticulate. They could not make the intruder understand the injustice which had been inflicted upon them. They were left confused and helpless. It is well known and accepted that Indigenous peoples have been constructed by colonial paradigms of knowledge as a not knowing peoples. I have little interest in rehearsing descriptions or of primitives or noble savages, of prehistoric, undeveloped, subhuman beings. Our family stories and memories are already filled with the harm and damage inflicted by those nations, notions, and the racialized categories they ordered us and our ancestors into. And it is also true that our libraries are already filled with these accounts. That is all to say, I do not need to rehearse that which we already know about how we have been known. Instead, I take this particular claim about the tragedy of the inarticulate to tell a story about the work that that tragedy continues to do and the work that it distracts us from in the present. I want to reveal the messy entanglements between the construction of Indigenous peoples as a not knowing people and the sustained and growing desire of the academy to know Indigenous peoples, to hold our bodies and our minds closer than ever and dare to call it decolonisation. <laughs> 
In the minutes that follow, I want to play with these entanglements as though inarticulateness, desire and tragedy, the West and the rest and myself are a string woven into a cat's cradle of sorts. The Academy, sorry, I'm reading from a script and I've just um, lost my place. The Academy may like to think that Indigenous peoples are the knotted aberrations in the cradle of knowledge, a mistaken twist from long ago that today pulls us into knots we cannot escape, that will never be undone. Today I want to suggest that Indigenous peoples and their knowledges are not the knots, but the hands that might weave their unravelling. In 2001, as a first year law student, a newspaper article on cultural adoption practices in the Torres Strait was set as a required reading for the foundational course, History and Philosophy of Law. With hindsight, and now as a lecturer myself, I can appreciate the sincerity with which this was done. In the very first few weeks of the first semester in the first year of a law degree, to be willing to open up conversations around the legitimacy and foundation of legal orders, of the possibilities of legal pluralism in an ongoing colonial context is excellent teaching. And yet the article was so profoundly at odds with what I knew. As I read it, I had the sense that adoption in the Torres Straits was such a source of deep shame that no one dared talk about it for fear of retribution. While I can accept this may well be the case for some families, it was not the case in mine. It was true that no one really talked about it and shame culture is definitely familiar. <laughs> but on this particular account of adoption, I felt great unease. As a student reading through those words in a classroom of text-based sources, not an elder to be seen. I didn't even know how to begin to engage. Was this true? Was I wrong? Why should I have felt so uneasy about a subject in which I was the only person in the room who had had any experience of it? I stayed silent. Later I called my mum, my white mum, and I just asked, does this sound right? She told me, I don't know. Maybe we don't talk about it because everyone just knows that there's no shame in it. In your family, it's no secret. I asked about my aunt, who was actually my cousin, or my cousin, who will always be my auntie. I learned that my grandmother adopted her under the state law so that she couldn't be taken. But then I learned later still that this wouldn't have been possible in Queensland family law. Family members cannot adopt relatives. Hence the problem of the state not recognising cultural adoption practices in the first place, a problem that was only resolved this year, thanks to the tireless efforts of many, including Torres Strait Islander lawyer and legal scholar, Dr. Heron Loven. So 20 years on from that day, I still don't really know. I could ask more questions, but I honestly don't feel I need to know. My aunt was loved. She belonged to us as we belonged to her. We grieve her terribly. And that's all there is to know about that. Still, it was the case that once upon a time in a classroom, not so far away from here, I found myself unable to articulate my own knowing of the world into a history and philosophy of law school, law class. And in the later years, as I have become more able to do so, I have mostly refused. Do you think I prove John Bleakley's words correct? Was my condition a tragedy of the inarticulate? Am I confused, helpless? Do I still, not know my own condition of the injustices that have inflicted my family. I don't remember feeling so. I thought the text strange. I thought the journalists to be struggling 
I saw a teacher navigating students around a text that presumed to contain a knowledge about the world they'd never encountered. I found that teacher to be of good intentions, but of limited skill. All around me, colonisers wove a story about Torres Strait Islanders in order to make meaning of a legal system of their own, drawing attention to the legal system of their other to define itself. And I did not think that to be a sign of my own limitations. No doubt I could have corrected the record or at least added some depth and nuance to the account, but it was my first semester at university and I was resolute. I did not come to correct the record or educate my teachers. I came to learn, to be a student. But I quickly realised that arriving at the university thinking I could learn about the world was a mistake. Instead, I had come to learn only what the academy believes the world to be. And what the university knows, can know, remains partial and incomplete. What I learned that day was how journalists and academics, each storytellers of their own kind, struggle to express their understanding of the world around them, of finding themselves saying one thing, thinking it meant something that it actually didn't. It was a tragedy, I suppose, of the inarticulate kind. I reflect on this moment a lot. It didn't feel unsafe, though I think this is what some might describe as a form of violence. It didn't rattle me. I was bemused more than anything. How odd, I thought, to go to such lengths to write and to talk about a thing you know nothing about in order to demonstrate a knowledge about something you do. I learned in the years of study that followed that much of Western knowledge can be like this. There is something about modernity's preoccupation with the objective outsider in scientific positivist methods that travel uneasily at times across complex terrains. It is useful for many, many things, but it also elicits a desire to command a knowledge of something that is outside of you, separate from you, as a way of affirming yourself and that you can know. This desire, this will to knowledge, if you will permit me just a little Foucault, is a power dynamic quite like no other. So I reflect on this a lot and increasingly so as my career has taken a direction in which I am often called to speak on matters of Indigenous concern. Interestingly, I am asked much less often to speak to the matters that interest me most. And I am never asked to speak to matters of an islander's concern. That specificity might illuminate too much context that has little to do with the state, with the settler, with its colonisers. Instead, I am asked to speak to matters of Indigenous concern in a way that allows a treatment of Indigenous peoples in the broadest of brush strokes that are sought to illuminate and bring meaning to and give context to the colonisers' understanding of the world that they occupy. I'm asked to speak to matters of Indigenous concern such that it might transform how non-Indigenous peoples might be able to articulate themselves in the world anew. I am now the academic, the educator in the classroom. I am trained in law, though I've never practiced, and also in Western political theory, which for all my sins is work I love. When I turn my mind's attention then to Indigenous knowledge, which is an increasing focus of attention across the acad academy as a whole, I find myself doing so both as a political theorist in the Western tradition and as an Indigenous person. And to declare both at the outset is a considered one. Sarah Hunt, a Kwokwokyawokwa geographer, writes of herself, the voice I raise is at once Indigenous and scholar, though it feels impossible to be heard as both at the same time. Kanawake Mohawk scholar Audra Simpson frames this slightly differently in her book Mohawk Interruptus when she writes that 
knowing and representing people within those places, the empire's colonies, required more than military might. It required the methods and modalities of knowing. In particular, categorization, ethnological comparison, linguistic translation, and ethnography. The construction of the indigenous subject as a not knowing one was deliberate and essential for the task of territorial expansion and control. And in this moment, so too was the international order of modern states born. And what would that order look like were it not for our dispossession? Settler Canadian scholar Karina Shaw observes in her book, Indigeneity and the International, that in the very constitution of the modern international order of states, indigenous peoples and our dispossession are what made the West as much as any European political philosopher. And political theorist Ludna Alamin has written of the non-Western Western divide in political thought more broadly, that Europe was never separate from the rest of the world and thus did not develop its ideas out of nowhere. It was precisely its colonial experience that was crucial to the formation of some of its ideas. These are powerful injunctions into the discipline of politics and political theory that struggle so deeply in attending to any kinds of questions of difference. The point that Simpson, Shaw and Alamein each make from three very different perspectives is that modern Western political thought and theorizing arises in the very context and because of and in aid of the colonial project. Alamein asks, why have we been able to conceive of the theorist as being anything but a Westerner? It is a question Indigenous scholars world over answer time and time again. There are others I can name here too, Franz Fanon, Saeed, Charles Taylor and Axel Honneth's theories of recognition, Dene scholar Glenn Coulthard's powerful critique of those theories. Closer to home, the work of Eileen Morton Robinson, Irene Watson, Mary Graham and others all work to reveal the limits of Western knowledge and the politics of its production. And more importantly, centre and theorise Indigenous knowledge in ways that reference country and the universe and not the coloniser. I could speak for hours, write books for the remainder of my career, that simply document and rehearse the shelves of scholarship that already exists accounting for these politics of knowledge production. But I wouldn't be adding anything new. My point here is a simple one. We know all this already. Aaron Agrawal wrote in 1995 of the presumed distinction between Indigenous and Western knowledge in terms of both its epistemological and practical consequences. He foreshadowed then the risks that remain in play today that in a Western paradigm of knowledge making that constructs Indigenous people as pre-modern not knowing, then scholars are faced with having to either demonstrate Indigenous knowledge as modern, scientific and objective, or emphasise ontological distinctions that can hold it apart and separate it from the modern and Western in ways that make it sacred and unverifiable from outside of itself. Of course, neither choice is a fair choice because it's a choice born of modern binaries that are false in the first place. But still, it's a real dynamic that we see play out often in debates about Indigenous knowledge. My contribution to those debates is simply one that says, this is not a bind of our making. Best not play into it. But still, if we know all this, if this work has been taking place in the academy for decades now, why are we still wrestling with knots in a cat's cradle instead of getting on with the problems and curiosities that animate ourselves as Indigenous peoples in the university beyond it? This is all to say that our not knowing status was never about us. It was about what our not knowing status could create for others a modern civilization and a new international order of states to start. And if it was about that and not us, 
then why must we continue to rehearse debates about whether Indigenous people can know rather than be known? We know that Indigenous people know things. This is why I despair at the rehearsing of the archive. Contemporary educators today that continue to position us as a not knowing people or as somehow deficient are racist and they will not be transformed by our articulations of the wrongs of the pseudosciences and bad knowledge practices of the past. Articulating that over and over again is the work of distraction. We don't counter racism in the classroom by proving our intellectual capacity. We counter racism by anti-racist action and decision-making on editorial boards, in peer review, and on selection committees. So let's leave these reductive stereotypes and racial categorizations that subjugated us as a not knowing people to, us, to the side. Let's see if we can start somewhere else. What if we start from the idea that we are a more knowing people, not just equals, not just intelligent and intelligible, not just a diverse face or a fresh perspective at the table? What if we start from the idea that what we know, how we know it and how we use it is more sophisticated than the academy we operate within? What if that is true? whether we practice traditional Indigenous knowledges that may well be ontologically or epistemologically distinct, or if we are Indigenous peoples who know and can capably command the tools that Western knowledge falsely claims a monopoly over. What if we understand ourselves as people who know more than the university will ever be able to encompass? And as people who have had no choice but to skill and train ourselves in Western histories and philosophies of science, in theories of knowledge, in multiple legal, social and political systems, simply to exist as a student in a classroom. What if, in order to be able to see how we are positioned in a newspaper article in a first year law class, we recognise that what we have to know is not just the history of our family, our community, our people, our laws, but also how it is that our colonisers positioned us in the first place, ordered us into racial categorizations for their own benefit and created institutions that uphold it still. What if we begin from a place in which the university must consider that its Indigenous students are its greatest asset? smarter than the rest, more knowledgeable than the rest, and navigating far greater complexities than the rest. As Indigenous students and scholars, so much of our intellectual labour is devoted to the difficult work of translating meaning across knowledge systems, or at least across cultural difference. To be able to do this, to be able to articulate the discomfort with how we see ourselves and our practices represented in texts in ways that do not fit with our own lived experiences and expressions, is to be able to capably do three things. To understand the politics of knowledge production and how we are embedded in it. To grapple with what may or may not be epistemological or ontological differences. And finally, it means that we can evaluate and assess the risks we take in speaking against authoritative knowledge and sources. And in making that decision for those who do end up playing the role of educator in a space in which we are first meant to be the student. We do all of this just in order to be present in a university. That is, we do this before we can even meet the task of learning what is prescribed to us in a curricula or in the task of designing the curricula itself. Toni Morrison famously said, the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. And she goes on to say, Somebody says you have no language and you spend 20 years proving that you do. 
Somebody says your head isn't shaped properly, so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Somebody says you have no art, so you dredge that up. Somebody says you have no kingdoms, so you dredge that up. She says, none of this is necessary. It will always be one more thing. To articulate ourselves against the charge that we are inarticulate is just one more distraction. Universities around the world are accelerating their desire to embed Indigenous peoples and their knowledges in their teaching and research. This is welcome, but to undertake this work well, capably, and with an orientation toward a fuller understanding of the universe, universities must reckon with the complicity of educational institutions in Indigenous oppression. To fail to do so is a failure to reckon with the politics of knowledge production itself. This is not work that is achieved by insisting that Indigenous peoples be the ones to better articulate themselves into the academy. This is not our work to do at all. Torres Strait Islanders, Aboriginal peoples and First Nations people across the globe always were and always will be knowledge holders and knowledge makers. We are scientists and theorists and artists and carers and astronomers and engineers and philosophers. And we always have been. Our job is not to help the West articulate itself, not to make it civilized or give meaning to its legal and political orders, nor is our job to redeem universities for their complicity in our subjugation. Our job is to do as we have always done, to pursue our curiosities and deepen our understanding of ourselves in the universe we belong to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sana. Um, just while we're waiting for some questions to come in, um, I'd like to go back to something that you mentioned very just at the very beginning, this idea of Indigenous people not being knots in that cat's cradle of society and nationhood, the, you know, the, the problems, you know, the punctuation in the discourse of deficit, but the hands that, that, that could be there to undo those knots. Um, the knots are, are not ours, We're not necessarily ours that we made, although sometimes we perhaps complicate those knots in our, in our efforts to try and resolve things um, by engaging with racism, not as a distraction, but perhaps as a reality <laughs> that we have to acknowledge in order to confront. Um, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of good intention brought by indigenous people to that challenge and then once once you enter the academy there's a whole bunch of skills that you then need to um, to uh, embrace in order to be able to have an impact well at least that's what we're told <laughs> that we have to do um, and that can really erode after a while. We're only human and we've all, we all know people or we, we have ourselves experienced that, that thing called burnout from time to time where we have to just disappear and, and regroup and re-nourish ourselves, go back to country or back to family for a while. Um, how, how, do we, how do we deal with that conundrum of, of good intention versus, versus skills? Um, how, do, how do we address that problem, do you think? Um, so we don't, we I, don't wear our knuckles down to the bone trying to trying to undo yeah. what's not. I mean, it's. A, I mean, I think it's. I think it's the big question that so many of us who work in the university struggle with because, you know, good intentions can be a helpful starting point. They can be a good entry, right? If you can find those people with those good intentions, you can be like, okay, but they also um, are work. They're also sites of work. Um, and depending on our roles, that they are sites of work that fall beyond our job description. Um, I think the way that I have started to try and approach it, and by no means do I have any sense of whether this will work well or not, um, but the way that I'm really trying to do it is to turn it back around on non-Indigenous academics and to sort of say, well, 
you know, what do you know about your discipline? What do you know about the kinds of scholarly debates and conversations, key concepts that have taken shape in your areas of work and the role it has played in relation to constructing understandings of Indigenous peoples that have been harmful? Um, because that's the question that is often brought to Indigenous academics in my observation. We are asked, we are asked to articulate that for non-Indigenous academics as though we received a different university education from their own. I often tell my, my colleagues, I did the same politics major as you. <laughs> if you didn't learn this stuff in your degrees, then I didn't either. And so if I harness that knowledge and if I have that understanding of our discipline and its complicity in Indigenous oppression, um, then I did that work somewhere else. Are you going to do that work somewhere else? Um, really, I think it's about starting to, for myself, I'm, I'm speaking personally now because this is, this 12 months has been quite a career shift for me, um, um, which is about starting to draw some harder lines and boundaries around what are my responsibilities as a Torres Strait Islander in the university responsible for Indigenous strategy within a particular faculty? And what are your responsibilities as someone who says you are credentialed to know and understand the world? Um. We have a question that relates to um, a quote, a quote that I, I, I'm not familiar with, but I'll take it that this is a, an accurate quote from uh, a colleague, I think, at Melbourne, uh, David Tacey, um, who mm -hmm. says, stated in two, 2016 that a spiritually impoverished but technologically advanced people came into contact with a spiritually advanced but technologically limited people in 1788. It was a class of clash of cultures at an extreme level. Um, what have you got to say about this? These these um, these ideas of technology and and uh, and spirituality and um, those, that dichotomy. I. I don't know um, Professor Tracy, and so there is no disrespect in my cr cr criticism of that statement. Um, but I think what that statement reflects in dichotomizing technology and spirituality is a reflection of a whole range of dichotomies that were born out of the Enlightenment um, in continental Europe. And I think that was a very historical moment and it broke um, the foundation of knowledge in the West, it, it sh transformed the ontological foundation of Western knowledge from being grounded in faith and religion and the church um, as a source of knowledge of human existence and instead shifted it to scientific forms of objective reasoning and knowledge production. And so to place spirituality on the one hand and technolo technology on the other is in itself a um, a product of the Western paradigm of producing knowledge. And I don't accept it. Um, I don't accept that we need to order the world into these categories. I don't accept that um, human beings can live on this continent for, you know, 60, 100,000 years and not have incredibly sophisticated technologies to be able to um, navigate the land, to uh, harvest crops, to be able to fish, to be able to sustain and nourish life. Um, I don't accept that looking to the stars is spirituality and not astronomy. Um, and I think that the West um, would re recover a great deal of understanding about our universe if it were to challenge itself to really think about what those binaries broke down in their understanding of the world um, and to hold that in play alongside all the things that we know it did produce that have been useful and helpful. One of the, um, one of the pressures I think that many Indigenous scholars feel or even just students when they first leave their communities and head off to often a remote city to go to university is um, there's a feeling of 
of alienation that starts to build from from their their home community, from from their their families, um, and maybe even accusations from the grassroots that oh, you know, you're just being assimilated there. You come back using all this onto what is that word? Yeah, what is that word? What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> um, you know, is what. Is there a fine line that you have to walk or, or is it not even a question? Are, are we, do we need to rethink this idea that, that getting on the main arena and playing the main game with the academy is some form of assimilation? Um, I don't think it's a form of assimilation, um, but I would say that. And it's definitely an accusation that's been laid at my feet um, as someone who um, studies and practices in Western political thought, you know, I, many would argue, I'm sure, that my mind has been colonised um, and that my decolonial projects have to be on, on myself before institutions. Um, the first thing I would say is that I think we need to make a lot more room in universities around students to explore that um, because it's something that I, I have had to reflect on and grapple with at different moments in my studies over 20 years. And it's not a light bulb. It's not, it's not in a good book you read and pick up and suddenly resolve and understand. But it is a tension that, again, I think is grounded in the ways that Indigenous peoples were constructed as an idea that gave meaning to modern civilization. And so the accusation that when we go to university and we study white authored texts and we cite white scholars that we are assimilated is really an accusation that um, the more you know, the less black you are. And that's racist. That doesn't do anyone good. But I do think it's also helpful as you come into the university and you acquire the command of Western knowledge and its methods that we also have room to bring our own criticality to that as Indigenous peoples. And there is, to my mind, in the research training process through, you know, my experiences in BA degrees and honours and PhDs, very little room for students to play with um, methodologies as sites of contestation rather than sites of practice. Um, and I think if we gave all students, but Indigenous in particular, a lot more room to play in that space, um, very exciting things would come from it. Um, can I ask you a couple of questions about identity? Um, <laughs> yes. But maybe not the, not the sort of questions that you might usually expect. Um, I can't remember the article. I should have dug it out. But... Um, your father wrote in an article some time ago about when he was writing about Aboriginal education and the role of identity. And I think he, he from memory, he, he was warning against the danger of essentialized Indigenous identities. And many people will, will be familiar with this idea of strategic essentialism. Mm -hmm. um, that what they, what they were in danger of doing was, was stripping away the ability of a of a young Indigenous student to be able to critically and reflectively place themselves in that transactional environment of, of, of teaching and learning. Um, what, what, what would you add to that idea? Um, what would I add to that idea? I think, um, I think the reflection I would offer is that in a lot of ways, my capacity in my first year law class to not be overwhelmed um, to not feel uh, to not have that experience and to have it feel like a form of harm or violence which I know is how it feels to lots of students right because of the experiences that they have um, it never felt like that to me and I think a big reason for that was because even though I didn't know it at the time I'd been equipped I guess by my father's own position in the world and the work that he had been theorizing to understand that this was about the classroom and not about me. Um, to the point around essentializing of identities, I think, you know, 
I've had to be a student of my father's work like everyone else. And I've had to do it outside of classrooms because I haven't taken courses where his work is studied. Um, we don't have dinner parties or, or, or holidays where we sit around and talk about these things, which I think always surprises people. Um, but I think where I land on that as an educator is really the way in which I see this idea. I get it in terms of questions from non-Indigenous academics about how to do the right thing in curriculum or classrooms. Um, but I also see it from Indigenous educators as well. This idea that there is something fundamental, essential to being Aboriginal or Islander that we all share across this vast continent that is emptied of other dimensions of our identity, like gender and sex and sexuality and class, um, but also, also adopts these same frameworks of the Western tradition that then get us tangled in those knots. They get us climbing, you know, we're, we're there in the cat's cradle trying to kind of get these entanglements out from around our body when instead we could understand that that cradle was not of our making and if you take a deep breath and you take some time and you can step back and for some people that means going to country um, and being on country and for some people it doesn't <laughs> you know and that's fine but find that space where you can step out of it and sort of try to see it for what it is on your own terms rather than being told who it is that you are in that messy entanglement. That, that gets back to that, that really powerful idea from Toni Morrison that, that race is a massive distraction and the idea itself is, is disempowering and even engaging with and rejecting the idea involves disempowerment. Um, so when do we get to or how do we craft or should we be looking to craft a, a post-racial world and what the hell might that mean? And in a post-racial world, What's the role of so-called non-Indigenous people? What's, what's their identity? Yeah, so I don't, I mean, I guess I don't, I wouldn't go to a post-racial world. I, I, maybe it's just a point that I get stuck on, but, you know, I can't really imagine decol decolonised universities, to be honest, any more than I can imagine a post-racial world. Um, these may be kind of social orders and categorizations that have been constructed on the foundations of bad science, but they have material and cultural effects in the world that if we were to deny, we would fail to see ourselves fully in the world. Um, you know, I'm not a race scholar. I think there are better Aboriginal scholars on race, you know, including people like Bronwyn Carlson and Chelsea Bond than I. Um, but I guess a part of it is that I, I'm not sure it is about moving past in a teleological sense. I'm not sure it's about leaving behind racism or leaving behind colonisation. I think it's about opening up other landscapes and terrains in which Indigenous peoples can articulate themselves to the full universe tiny bits of which include moments of colonisation and racial systems of oppression, but also have huge, um, huge spaces of meaning and existence that can, can be shaped by other things. And I don't want to minimise how pervasive racist violence is. Um, but, you know, and I, I read this in some black political thought and African-American scholarship of, you know, the experience of those who they're not black until they step into a white neighborhood. Right. Um, and I feel that I, I remember experiencing that very much as a young child who was moving between the Torres Straits and the mainland and that that racial awareness comes at the point in which um, others choose to mark out your difference rather than that's because of some innate difference that you experienced all through your life. Um, and so I, I guess what I would say is it's not about moving past, it's about opening up different landscapes and terrains and spaces and understanding that we can sit there too. And one more question, um, and this is where I ask you to help us solve um, a, big, a big political, economic, social problem that we have in Australia today, and that is universities' 
being squeezed by neoliberal managerialism. And, and so what, what do you think that Indigenous scholars can bring to, to uh, confront that problem? Um, I think two things mostly. One, I'm really mad. Like, I'm so angry this year. And I'm angry because it has taken so many generations and so many decades to finally have significant numbers of Aboriginal and Islander people coming through with PhDs and other qualifications. And now, now is the time that suddenly that we're in the door, they're going to close the door to everyone. Um, I couldn't be more mad. It seems so unfair. Um, I also have taken great comfort, I think, as a Torres Strait Islander this year in the sense that I have always known that the university does not have a monopoly on knowledge. Knowledge is knowledge can come from country, knowledge can come from our elders. We know that there are vast ways of understanding and theorising the world um, that do not have to rely on the university. And I think that's always allowed me a space to sort of say, I can use the university while I'm here. And while I'm here in an act of reciprocity as a kind of relational dynamic I have been raised to honour, I reciprocate to the institution by trying to make it a better institution for others who want to come in and use it how they will. Um, but the university, to my mind, is not the be all and the end all for knowledge. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up. Um, I and I'm sure everybody else have really enjoyed the uh, the energy and and the optimism and the determination that that uh, you've brought to this lecture. Um, those of you who want to read more um, um, or hear more, read more from. Uh, from Sana's work, please just find her on the, I think, find an expert page at University of Melbourne and there'll be information there about her publications and her uh, active research interests and an ability to get in touch with her directly. Um, this evening's talk will be available soon as a video and podcast via the Island of Ideas website that's now on your screens. And um, the series continues with upcoming online public lectures and forums. Uh, also on your screen. I strongly encourage you to uh, continue the discussion by registering for these talks. Um, the University of Tasmania is looking forward to continuing the ideas, debate and discussion um, for and from Tasmania. Um, thank you particularly to those of you from outside our island state uh, for joining us this evening. And thank you very much for taking part in this event. I'm really sorry to have to call it to an end. I'd love to keep talking. Um, thank you again so much, Sana, um, and uh, good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Greg. <laughs>